just talk about that. So let's let's bring him out and uh, give a big fan expo welcome to Josh Keaton, everybody. Hello, hello. How's everybody doing? Thank you so much for being here. It's a nice, nice area. Yeah. yeah. It's a big room. It is a big room. It is a yeah. very big room. Yeah. We could put play like basketball. We could do. Yeah, curling. We could curling. Cur curling. You have to freeze the floor, but yeah. You know, you're in the talking to the right crowd. You know the. <laughs> I was just watching some curling while I was having lunch. Really? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's always on here. It was it's pretty interesting. <laughs> Curling. I actually had to look up why it was called curling, but I don't even know if I. Is it do you not know? They, because they, this, this, the sweeping and the rocks. The yeah, because of I guess rocks? it's to you know the, to to make the path of the of the stone kind of can curl, and they they sweep to make a, a less friction on the ice so that it can go straighter. I thought they just yelled like "hurry hard" because it was just funny. <laughs> I mean that too. <laughs> yeah, that too. But it's yeah, just, yeah. I feel I feel like they yell a lot and they don't have to yell. Like I feel like it's. They're really overdoing it, you know. I think it's a bit of a power move. It, it, it might be that, but I mean, yeah. it kind of it kind of gets the it's adrenaline true. pumping. It really well while you're I would here. Think that yelling would make you sweep harder. I know yeah. a lot of the rinks are we're ready to rock, so no pun intended. So we can, yeah. you and me later. All right, sweet. A bond, a bond spiel, as they call it. I'd love it. Curling bond spiel, Fan yes. Expo's first annual curling bond spiel. We can make this a thing. I think we should. I think we should I see if Shatner, so well. Shatner wants to show up too. That'd be he'd be like the ringer. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Legendary Canadian. He knows yes. how to curl it. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah, could yeah. he'd be you'd be surprised how good Shatner can curl. I would now love it. we have a lot of uh we we're mentioning, you know, some of the work that you've done, you know, Spider Man, some Green Lantern, what if and yes. you you've got so much, you know, your your roster of stuff. It's it's gotta be so cool, you know. I'm sure you like many of us grew up with a lot of these characters and then yeah. being able to bring them to life in, in some way must be kind of an incredible full circle It feeling. is because, I mean, I grew up as a geek, so I'm yeah. still a geek now. You never really leave that once you are that. And, um, I mean, a lot of these characters are characters that I grew up really enjoying and, and consuming and loving, like Spider-Man. Um, just the fact that I was able to, to play Spider-Man, the fact that I was able to be in a Disney movie, like these are all... When you're growing up as a kid and you're you're enjoying this media, this is, these are like things that, that you just dream about doing, and then it happens, mm -hmm. and you can kind of check that off your bucket list, and it's it's pretty amazing. It's now as a, as a voice actor, you know, playing characters like you know like Spider Man, you know Peter Parker, is it is it you know tougher to play a character that's more that's more uh, more of a subtle, I guess, difference from your your kind of main voice than like kind playing of. like a you know I feel like playing a pirate is like anyone can put on like the the R. But then you got to yes. do the to do a Peter Parker. That's a very subtle well, change. Well, yes and very... no. I mean, when uh, Spider-Man was my favorite, my favorite yeah. superhero growing up, still my favorite superhero to this day, and that's pretty much what I would read when I would read comics. And so there was always the voice in my head that was Spider-Man. Okay. And so it wasn't really a hard transition to do that. That being said, there's more. There are certain places that you kind of have to keep the performance, certain boundaries that you have to keep it in so that it still feels like Spider-Man, it still feels like mm -hmm. Peter Parker. Um, like the fact that he overcompensates his nerdiness when he's Peter Parker because he doesn't want anybody to find out that he could possibly be Spider-Man and then when he's Spider-Man he can finally yeah. let loose with his confidence and quippiness and all of that. Um, yeah. That's something that's kind of got to be true no matter who's playing Spider-Man. And within that you can kind of have a little bit of leeway to play around, but you still have, kind of have to keep it true. I'd say the, the most difficult one was what if, um, because I was basically having to be Chris Evans, and that, that's a very established performance, not just, yeah. not just as a character, but as a person's portrayal of that character, where for the last, I don't know how many years, people are, are, are used to seeing Chris Evans as that, and it, it has to be something at least very much in that vein for it to not take people out of the experience of watching the show. Yeah. So that was definitely something that I had to do more work in terms, of, in terms of really researching as much as I could. So what I did is I, I have all of the movies and I kind of opened up my computer, I, I pulled them up and I would basically record into my, um, into my Pro Tools setup. Pro Tools is an audio recording program for those who are unfamiliar. And so what I would do is I would record into Pro Tools pretty much every time Chris spoke, and I would categorize them. I would categorize, okay, this is like Captain America being, uh, you, know, you know, shouting in battle. This is him being, uh, you know, sweet with Peggy. This is him hanging out with uh, Bucky. And so I would have these categories of stuff, and then when things would come up in the script, 
I would just kind of reference those categories and just, just to kind of put myself in the frame of mind, in, in that voice, and, and be able to, to replicate as best I could what I felt he would do in that situation. So, I mean, that was definitely a bigger challenge than I was expecting. And, and to be honest, I was terrified because I didn't know in the beginning. Well, I mean, when I did it, I didn't really think much about it. I just kind of did it. It was like any other job. And then it wasn't until they were about to release What If that they told me that it was canonically part of the MCU. And at that point, I, I like, was like, oh my god, what am I going to do? Like, the, yeah. mar the fans are going to kill me because like, I'm not Chris and they're so used to seeing this performance. Um, but everybody was so supportive. Everybody was really nice. Like, um, I, a lot of positive feedback. Um, so, you know, it, it, I guess the, the, the work paid off. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, there, there definitely is something to, um, to what you said about it, about there not being as much room for interpretation. Like, yeah, if you're just doing a it's generic... Like, I feel like it's probably more difficult in a way to kind of really, because you're actually trying to model it after somebody. Yes. And I mean, some image, or not image, but some sound that they have in their head. Like Peter Parker has that, you know, that level of like worry in his voice and innocence. Yes. And you have to really kind of incorporate all that, because like you say, so it kind of... I feel like for the average person might be like, oh, it's maybe more difficult to create these big voices, but then the, yeah. the difficulty is probably in those subtleties. They're, they're exactly right. And there's different stages of it. So, um, yeah, like if you're just doing an original character, it's really, you have carte blanche. You could do whatever you yeah. want to do. And then the, the next hardest thing would be an established character that doesn't necessarily have like an actor who is the one who has always done it. And then the hardest thing would be a voice match. So, and, now, yeah. and now that you have Chris Evans' voice down, you can call, like, Hi, Bank of America, this is Chris Evans. <laughs> I'd like to transfer uh, my entire checking account to... Uh, I, I mean, if, if I could, I still wouldn't, because, yeah. you know, then he'd come looking for me. And yeah, I feel like you've just I, been, I haven't been training, so, you know, he'd... he'd like you must be on his watch list now. <laughs> I mean... Now, now that you do the voice, he's like, okay, this guy could be a potential threat, yeah, down, potential the, threat? Yeah. down the road. Yeah, We've got to yeah. be careful. People call him, hey, Chris, did you just call me? I got this weird <laughs> call. Josh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like you must have, it must have been a lot of Chris Evans binging that you had to, did you go through the uh, yeah. whole filmography? Everything. Yeah, everything. Wow. Yeah. And, and Chris from that is very different from other things he's done that haven't been Marvel. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You can go into, like, what was it, like, not uh, 10 Things, eight, not another teen movie? Was that not the one? Not another teen movie, I think, yeah. That's, yeah. Did, you, did yeah. that, in, was that encompassing? I mean, I, I looked at it just kind of, just to, just to just see if fun, it was, for just funsies. for fun, and yeah, I was yeah. like, this is, this is not even in the, in, the, in the same ballpark, so. I did that, too. The other day it was, like, Netflix, and I looked at it for fun, and then, like, two hours later, I'm like, oh, that was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, we have a few fans here today, and I know uh, some of you have questions. So if you yes. have a question for Josh, we're going to, I guess, raise our hands. And we have a mic runner running around, and we'll try to get the mic in front of you. So we'll yeah, go. anything. Anything about, um, about Spider-Man, about uh, Green Lantern, what if, upcoming Ooh, projects, yeah. voiceover in general. Um, I'm also kind of a handyman if you need like, help with house stuff. You know, I'm good. Car stuff. Um, I was just wondering, uh, before it was uh, canceled, uh, were there any talks of the story for Spider-Man Season 3? For Spectacular Spider-Man, yeah. there was actually, Greg actually had Spectacular Spider-Man planned out through Season 5, and then he had movies, like directed, direct to, uh, I mean, they don't really do DVDs anymore, but direct to uh, video movies. Um, and so basically the way it was going to go was that each season of Spectacular Spider-Man was going to be a year from Peter Parker's life. I mean, sorry, a, a year from Peter Parker's high school career. Um, and the end of the show was going to culminate with him graduating. And then, um, and yeah, yeah, I mean, there, he had everything planned out. He even sowed the seeds in season two of other villains that you didn't see. He, uh, you know, Morris Bench was in there, so Hydro Man was going to make an appearance. Uh, Cletus Cassidy was was very briefly shown in there. That was gonna that was gonna pay off at some point. So, um, and one thing like that a lot of people don't know about Spectacular Spider-Man is that every single character that was named in the show, no matter how small, even if one line was from the comics, everybody. There was not one person who spoke in that show or who had a name that was not directly taken from the comics, no matter how obscure. So, I mean, it was, that was definitely a show by Spider-Man fans, for Spider-Man fans. Everybody on that show really, really loved, loved uh, the character. 
and loved the mythos, and uh, and it was it was a love letter to Spider Man. Cool, that's very cool. We had other okay right yes. over there. Yeah, go ahead. Sora. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Josh. How's it going? Good. How are you? Uh, not bad. Um, yeah. So my question for you, basically, I mean, I'm not, not going to waste too much time here, but my base, my question for you is. Um, so uh, as you've said before, you've done stuff for Disney. You were in Hercules. You played young Hercules. Yes. So I was just wondering, like, in addition to that, you were also in the video game, not, not the first Kingdom Hearts game, because as you can see, I'm cosplaying as Sora. Yes. But you were in Bur Birth by Sleep. So I was just wondering, like, between working on the original Hercules and working on Birth by Sleep, um, did you find that when you were working on Birth by Sleep that your voice, like, was your voice, did you find your voice matured a bit from when you first oh, first yeah. in I the mean, first my, movie or like yeah yeah my voice had matured even like during the process of doing Hercules like I was that was like literally right at the time where my voice was starting to change so um, I originally did the singing in the movie but because I was going through a voice change there were like certain notes that were harder for me to hold out and so I mean now with computers and everything they just would have done a bunch of takes and spliced them all together and it still would have been me but back then they didn't do they didn't record anything that way like i actually recorded it with the orchestra with a live yeah. orchestra and everything so so in birth uh, by sleep you sounded the same way like I, if i sounded the same that's incredible because <laughs> i was several years old, like much older and and i maybe felt slight sorry maybe slightly different but not too different though. well thank you so much that thank is, you that makes me feel fantastic because it was really really difficult and i went into that session very nervous that i wasn't going to be able to sound the same since it was pre-voice change me with post voice change me doing it. So, um, but I mean, uh, I basically went in there playing the same attitude. So it was the same kind of character vibe just through older vocal cords. But yeah, but basically it's still the same voice, obviously. That's awesome. Obviously. I, I really appreciate it. But it is, right? Like, you know, yeah, it no, is. I was, it was my best approximation of what I sounded like at 16. I was going to say, your voice actually sounds different than backstage already. It's changed three times at least since yes. we started this. <laughs> You're going, really, just, wow, riding the waves. Okay, you have the mic over there. Go ahead. Uh, yes, hello. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, who is your favorite Spider-Man actor who isn't you, and did any of them, like, inspire you in playing Spider-Man? Um, let me see. That's actually a really good question. Um, Honestly, I, there, there's, there's something that I really like about all of the Spider-Men. Um, I mean, Tobey Maguire, like, tap dancing on top of a bar, and that then was like, a flipping little, the bangs. That was a little sus. I mean, that's got to be... Lie. That, that wasn't number one, right there, obvious. That was not... I, I'm not going to lie, that was not my favorite movie. <laughs> um, but I did love Spider-Man 1 and 2. I really, I really liked Tobey as, um, as Peter Parker. Um, funnily enough, I feel like... Um, I, I feel like Topher Grace, who played... Um, Eddie Brock in Spider-Man 3 would have been a better Spider-Man because Eric Foreman is pretty much Peter Parker. Like, that's the, it's like the same guy. And he's hilarious. Like, I feel like his, his quip ability was, was much better than Toby's. And I feel, like in the, I, I feel like there wasn't as much of a difference. There wasn't a clear distinction between Peter Parker out of the suit and Spider-Man in the suit with Toby's Spider-Man. And that's not to take anything away from it. I still think he did a great job. I just, I like my Spider-Man a little bit more quippy than that. And I feel like, I feel like Topher Grace would have been fantastic. Uh, but I, I do love, uh, I, I do love uh, Toby's Peter. Wait, that sounded terrible. I do love Toby's Peter Parker. Um, now, um, and then I also kind of like, like that there was a cool vibe that, uh, that Andrew Garfield brought to it. And then, and, and I mean, I love Tom Holland. I, I, think, that, I think that he's done a really good job as Spider-Man. I think he's done a great job carrying on the mantle. Um, I mean, I, I really feel like there's, there's something great to be said for everybody that's played Spider-Man. It's, it's a small club, but, um, but there's, there's a lot of good stuff. You know, Chris Barnes from the 90s show was great. Um, I, I'm friends, personal friends with Dan Gilvezan, who was Spider-Man in Spider-Man and his amazing friends. And, uh, like, there's, there's just... There, there's something that everybody brings to it while still keeping it within uh, a Peter Parker framework that is, that is just really fun to see. It's really fun to see what everybody does with it. Um, so I, it, it'd be really hard for me to pick a favorite because there's certain like little pieces out of everybody's performance that I've really loved. Um, I wouldn't say that I was necessarily inspired by anybody because as a lifelong Spider-Man fan, there was always that Spider-Man voice in my head when I read the comics, which was what I put out. And so 
that's what, what I was bringing to you was, was pretty much directly what I had developed in my head for all those years. Thank you for the question. Yes. Oh, okay, go ahead. Sure. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm great. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm here. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> um, so, but, like, you've done a lot. You've done Marvels, you've done Disney, you've done Netflix. Which company did you have, like, the most fun working with? And when it came to, well, I guess this is kind of two questions, sorry. Um, when you did um, Netflix, when you did Voltron, uh -huh. how much fun did you have with doing Shiro in comparison to the original Voltron? Well, I definitely feel like, um, I'd say in terms of like working for a company, um, Netflix was probably the one that I worked for the longest, like at once. So they're the ones I have the most experience with in terms of them sending me out to conventions and stuff like that. Like that was really fun. So I would definitely have to give props to Netflix. But I mean, working for Disney was awesome. Working for Universal was awesome. When I, I, I was um, Jules in the Back to the Future animated series, the, the Brainy Kid. And I mean, they, they sent me to Universal Studios when they opened the ride. And so I got to be like one of the first people on the ride. That was super cool. Um, Disney for a while, like I would just get into Disneyland whenever I wanted to go. Like it, it was cool. They would have like a guide take me around when I was um, still coming off of the Hercules thing. Like it was, it was just neat. Like they- the plaid tour. Uh, the, yes. The plaid, that, yeah, the, that's a ride. What's that called? It's called the, it's like the plaid, they call it. The that's plaid the, tour? Because you get the plaid, the guys with the plaid vests. Oh, I, that bring I, you didn't around. Know, I didn't know it had a name. It's a thing, man. That's a. That's super cool. You can get it. You can actually go on the website. I, you can, you I can had, buy. You can buy the package. It's like the. Yeah, for like a year, I had the permanent plaid tour. Wow, that was, that was amazing. That's um, that but, but the thing that I did have to do, itself. I had to go on. Um, oh no, you know what? They extended my plaid tour. I did uh, this live action thing for a show called Even Stevens, uh, the Even Stevens movie. Um, I was much buffer and I had blonde hair and I was shirtless in the movie most of the time. And so when I did that, they also took me to California Adventure, I think. But I had to be on Radio Disney. Like, that was the condition. It's like, you got to do an interview on Radio Disney, and then you can go in the park and just do whatever you want. So worth I was like, it. all right, it was totally worth it. Yeah, totally worth it. But, Did you get to go, like, behind the scenes, too? Did they, like, oh, yeah. pick you up in the vehicle and drive you park yeah. to park? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's super cool. cool. Like, that's, that's, cool. that's the kind of stuff, like, I love those little perks. Those, those are neat. They're, they're fleeting. Like, once the project is gone, they don't know your name anymore, and they don't know who you are. And it's like, you call up and say, hey, can I, who's this? Click. Oh. Yeah. Chris Evans? No? Okay. Um, but um, I'm sorry, what was the, the other part of your question was? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and my other question was, when doing the new Voltron for Shiro, yes. how was it uh, like difficult to kind of be... It, it actually wasn't difficult at all. Original? It wasn't difficult at all because they made it very, very clear that the new Voltron was not going to reference the old Sven, Sven Shiro, Sven Ro. It wasn't going to be him at all. So I felt like I really had a lot of freedom to, um, to really explore the character and really just bring whatever I wanted to bring to him. Um, so, I mean, making the voice was pretty much just going into more of a baritone of myself um, and, and just kind of placing it down here more. And, but still kind of keeping him compassionate, you know, Give, making him somebody that could be a, a, a leader and a, and a leadership figure. But, but still giving him some compassion. So I wanted to, so I kind of put some air to his voice while keeping it low, because he's a big guy, you know. Um, I actually had to do push-ups in studio. I'm not kidding. Like, I had to do push-ups in studio before I would record the voice, because it would, I mean, you got, you got to open up the lungs for something like that. And so, um, and you know, just kind of get, get the blood pumping and all that, kind of put you in that. It also made me stand taller, and that kind of that helped. Because I'm not really a tall guy, and Shiro really is, so I kind of had to fake it. Fake it till you make it. Um, it's real. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I really felt like I had a lot, of, a lot of freedom. Now, the flip side of that is, for those who haven't seen Voltron, there is one episode in Voltron where they meet the alternate reality Shiro, who is Sven. Who is Sven with accent and all. Um, Yoo-hoo! Um, he's that guy. And so with that, I didn't know that I was going to be Sven until like the night before I came in to record. Because at this point, I thought Shiro, like Shiro basically died in the very, very early on in the show. And before we recorded that, the showrunners took me aside and said, okay, in today's episode, 
it's going to look like he dies. I'm like, what? I'm like, but I just got here. They're, they're like, it's okay. You're going to be coming back. And I'm like, okay, cool. They're like, just, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. It's just, this is temporary. And so a week went by, no call. Another week went by, no call. I think the third week went by, I'm like, am I really coming back or were they just telling me this so I didn't make a scene at the record? And so then they call me and they're like, okay, you know, my agent calls and says, you're booked for Voltron. I was like, oh, sweet, thank God. All right, I'm coming back. I'm back, baby. And I get the script. I get the script. We recorded on Thursdays, I want to say. And so I got the script on Wednesday. At like 8 o'clock at night, I get the email with the script. I'm reading it. I'm reading it. I'm reading it. And it's not Shiro. It's Sven. And I'm like, I have to be Sven? I'm like, I don't know how to do a Scandinavian accent. Like, I don't know how to do this at all. At all. What, what is going to happen tomorrow? And so I basically watched old Voltron. There's this group. Um, I really just tried to find anything from the region. And it's really hard to find stuff like when you're, when you're like looking in a panic at, at, you know, at night, trying to find stuff that is even remotely close to what Sven was like. Um, because I mean, I could have tried to fake it, but if you try to fake an accent like that, it's gonna be awful because it's not gonna be consistent. There's not like, you're gonna, you're gonna pronounce a vowel one way in one line and a different way in another line. And I mean, that might've been cool for it, but I think the tone of our show was a bit more grounded than the original Voltron. So I didn't really feel like just a horrible accent would have worked. So I found this, um, well, I, I didn't just find them that night. I was actually a fan of them already. There was a, a group, uh, co like a comedy team called Ilvis. Um, and they, they came out with this song that was viral on YouTube for a while called What Did the Fox Say or What Does the Fox Say? They're hilarious. If you've only seen that one song, you need to just go look, at, look up Ilvis because they're, they're hilarious, but they're fantastic singers and fantastic producers. Um, they've done, they did this one song about Stonehenge, which like you'll pee yourself laughing. It's hilarious. Um, but they've done so many other things and, you know, they kind of have accents from the region. I don't know if it's exactly where Sven was from, but I was like, well, this is like, this is, this is another universe. So it is what it is. And so I basically just watched that till two in the morning and, um, and went in and did the episode. And, and I guess it came out all right. For those who haven't seen it, I did a, a song for Sven. I, I have a, another one on YouTube called for, uh, where Shiro basically sings You're Welcome. And he sings that with the rest of the cast. So if you haven't seen it, Shiro, you're welcome. But if you haven't seen it, Sven Hallo. It's telling the story of what happened to Sven to the tune of Lionel Richie's Hello. Um, it's kind of ridiculous and very 80s. Um, and uh, lots, of, lots of just dark background and, and singing into the mic. Um, it's silly. Uh, but yeah, so that, that, was, that was difficult because that I knew was going to reference the original show. Whereas um, with Shiro, there, there, there really were none of those constraints. I felt very free to do that and, uh, and bring, and they were, they were very generous about letting me bring whatever I wanted to bring to him. And, and really, I think the, the biggest challenge for me with Shiro was playing such a toned down character because everything that I'm used to playing has been, you know, the coming of age teenage kid who's kind of just flying off the walls and he's crazy and he's just doing like in a hundred places at once. And, and that's what I've been used to playing. And so now that I got to play this, this big guy who, who isn't, you know, he, he's kind of unflappable, but on the underside, he has PTSD and he's not all right. Um, finding those levels in animation was definitely a challenge. But, um, but it was a challenge that I loved, and it, it, was, it was a beautiful character to play. Um, and, and that's pro uh, next to Spider Man, he's, he's probably my favorite character I've ever played. Cool. He's awesome. a, a beautiful soul. Yeah. Great. Thanks for the question. And now uh, we have time for a few more. So, yeah, go ahead over to you. No? I think you had it. Sorry. Maybe not. I thought you had a hand there. Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, uh, hi, I'm, hey. I'm Ryan. Um, I just want to say, like, Spectacular Spider-Man was, like, a huge, like, big thing for me when I was a kid. Thanks so much. <laughs> I was just going to ask, like, um, shit, I'm nervous. Um, it's all right. Uh, We're all friends here. Wh how was it, like, becoming uh, Spider-Man for the first time, like, getting the role in Spectacular Spider-Man? And how was it, like, 
taken up that responsibility of like... Well, it was, it kind of felt like a second chance because I was actually originally hired as Spider-Man on a different project before Spectacular Spider-Man. I was hired to be Spider-Man in the PlayStation game that went with the movie. Except after I had already recorded the entire game, they ended up getting Toby to do it. So they didn't want to waste all the audio they had done with me, so they basically put in like a hidden mode of play where if you beat the game, you can play it as like Harry in the goblin suit. It was really just a reskin of Spider-Man. They had me come in and do a couple of extra lines so that they could like tweak the cinema scene so that it didn't look like it was just a reskin, but it was really just a reskin. But like, you know, I was happy to still be in the game, but I was kind of bummed out that I wasn't Spider-Man because like, that's what I was hired to do. I was super excited to be Spider-Man. That was the first time I had ever been cast as Spider-Man. I thought it was amazing, uh, spectacular even. But um, I didn't, after I did that, I was kind of the de facto Harry Osborn for a while. So there was another game came, that came out. It was like a brawler called Spider-Man Friend or Foe. Really, actually kind of fun game. Um, and that they just hired me to be Harry. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm Harry now. Um, but um, then they had the auditions for Spectacular Spider-Man. And I kind of looked at that as a second chance. I was like, well... They're, they're not having me read for Harry, they're having me audition for Spider-Man, so let's, let's do this. And I, I felt kind of confident, because I'm like, well, I've already been cast for Spider-Man, so I just, gotta, I just gotta do that again. And, and I did it, and there were a bunch of callbacks, and I finally, I finally you know, made it through the gauntlet and got hired, and, and it was like a dream come true, to be honest. Like, I totally geeked out about it. I, I got a license plate that said Thwip, um, I had a Mini Cooper at the time, and they have the flat roofs, and I had like this vinyl thing made up so that it was basically Spider-Man on my roof. Like I, I really, I probably took it a little too far, but I mean, I don't think so. I think it was, I think it was just, just far enough. Like, it, it was amazing. It was spectacular. I got to meet all kinds of cool people. Um, Steve Bloom couldn't be here today because they, they lost his COVID results, and so he couldn't get on a plane. But that was my first time ever working with Steve, and he was Green Goblin, and he's the only voice I hear now when I hear Green Goblin, or when I think of Green Goblin, I think of Steve's voice. Um, like, I've been Green Goblin since then, and basically I'm really just trying to be Steve. <laughs> um, but yeah, I got to work with him, I got to work with Kevin Michael Richardson for the first time, I got to work with Trish Helfer, who showed up to record as Black Cat on a Harley in full, like, black leather. Uh, it, was, it was pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, it, w it was a dream come true, and, and it, it just, it felt like a second chance. It felt like, alright, well, I I kind of got booted from Spider-Man on this, but, you know, I can do it here. And, and I was lucky that it was such a, an amazing show, an amazing production with people who really loved the character. Now, thank cool. you. Thank you for the question. Awesome. We have a question. Uh, yeah, right there. Go ahead. Hey, what's up? Uh, um, how is it like uh, playing both the heroes of Spider-Man, uh, Harry Osborn, uh, also, his father uh, voicing uh, Norman Playing his Oswald. dad was a little weird. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> and also playing the villain, because you got to play uh, Electro against Electro, Yuri's yes. uh, Spider-Man. Yes. Um, <laughs> I've lived long enough to see myself become the villain. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, playing, playing heroes is great. Playing villains is very fun, because they're, in their mind, they are the hero. So to have to find that justification in their head is, is always interesting, and it's always a lot of fun. Um, a funny story about Electro is that he's actually patterned after a, uh, an electrician that came to work on my house. Um, like, and this was somebody that came to work on my house years before I even got cast in the game. Um, he, was he was basically just an East Coast guy. He had this kind of an accent. And I thought he was such a character. I was like, and, and, and everything was like, yeah, so uh, you want me to put the outlet where? Where you want me to put this outlet? Okay, okay, yeah, just show me. You show me. You show me where you want me to put the outlet. And so I was like, this guy's hilarious. And he wasn't even trying to be. I was like, I got to remember this guy. Because this, that, I mean, that's where we get our characters. We get our characters from the people we meet and, and mix and match them and all that. So when it came time to figure out something for Electro, I was like, well, this takes place in New York. I mean, Electro, I, the electrician. <laughs> I was like, it's got to be the electrician. <laughs> um, so I basically just patterned it after him. Um, and, th and that was really fun. Um, but yeah, Norman was a weird one, man. Norman was definitely a weird one. Um, and for those who don't know, in the, the, the current Spider-Man show, I'm, I'm Norman Osborn. 
I'm Norman Osborne. And um, it's, it's just bizarre. It's bizarre. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I'm still working on something. But it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's bizarre getting to be, like, Spider-Man's arch enemy <laughs> after being Spider-Man for so long. Um, but, hey, you know, like, those are the weird, the weird things that, that we love as actors. Like, that's, that's the kind of stuff that, that gives you a funny story to tell. And to, see, and to see things from another perspective, you know? Like, I, I've seen everything from Spider-Man's perspective for so long that to actually have to look at him and actually look at him as the menace and look at him as the person who's going to be the, the fly in your soup. Good soup. Um, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's something that as an actor is, is actually very fulfilling to have to now shift your perspective completely around to the other side. Very cool. Well, Josh, I appreciate the time, buddy. I yeah, know if you have absolutely. any other questions for Josh. Yeah, anybody you know, else? Speaking of oh, the people that we somebody. meet, I mean, we, we are, uh, you are here uh, today and tomorrow. Yeah, I'm you here today and tomorrow. Stop so by, if you want to come uh, chat. Stop by the table. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your time, buddy. Give it over time for, uh, for Josh Keaton, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs>